Okay. Well, welcome everybody. Um, so today's uh, part two of the lecture. Uh, I'll let Simona do the intro. I just wanted to give some uh, quick uh, housekeeping. Uh, so uh, feel free to ask if you have any questions. Uh, just post them in the chat. And like last time, I'll try to answer uh, as best as I can while Simona is presenting. But uh, if there is something that I uh, can get to, um, like we did last time, maybe Simone will pause uh, during the lecture a few times to see if anybody has some uh, some questions. You can just type them in the chat, and then I'll uh, I'll just read them for you. Um, I think uh, yeah, I hope uh, you guys enjoyed last time. We have part two now, and I'll maybe let uh, Simone take it from here. So hello everybody, thank you Giuseppe again for your nice introduction as usual and uh, my name is uh, Simone and I don't know if there is anybody new uh, in this part two but um, actually this is uh, part two, can you see my screen? I think so. Yes. So. Um, yeah, I don't know if there is anybody new who has not followed part one. Anyway, part one should be should have been also published on uh, the IOTEX YouTube channel. Uh, so, as I said, my name is Simona, Head of Developer Relations at IOTEX. Um, this is this is part two uh, of three parts, and in part one, last time, uh, we have introduced the, um, a little bit about blockchain technology. Uh, we are, have also mentioned uh, its limitations when uh, working with blockchain and real-world data. We have also introduced some concepts behind uh, the IOTEX machine file methodology that's needed to overcome such limitations when working with uh, real-world data and blockchain, which are usually trust limitations, uh, privacy limitations, and scalability limitations. Uh, scalability both in terms of data storage and in terms of data processing. Uh, we have also seen um, a pretty limited, I would say, Web3 ready example for a firmware that we built on a, an Arduino board. Uh, it has itself limitations, not because um, for any special reason, just because this is only um, an example, a proof of concept for you guys. So uh, it's not based on a production ready hardware or a production ready design. Uh, so it's lacking IoT security in terms, for example, of tamper-proof firmware or maybe um, protecting the flash, the data stored on the flash or um, other like for things like, I don't know, um, wake uh, sleep and, and wake on, uh, on activity and things like that. So we, we leave the, these ones to those of you who want to move further and, and bring this project to reality. So in this part two of this workshop uh, about machine fi uh, blockchain and real-world data. Um, I want to focus on uh, the second part of a machine fi application, on the second component of a machine fi application, which uh, is this off-chain computational infrastructure that is uh, intended to connect machines, or actually data coming from real-world machines, uh, to blockchain applications. And its main purpose eventually is to generate proofs that are based on real-world data and that can be ingested and used by smart contracts and so eventually by decentralized applications that run on a blockchain. Um, we at IOTEX are creating this uh, layer which we call Web3. And it's this one in the center uh, of this uh, image. So let's focus more uh, on this Web3 component. So, I'm giving um, like a look inside what's what's inside in this web stream uh, infrastructure. So what you see on the screen now uh, is the intended um, is the intended uh, uh, architecture or of a web stream node runtime. So what's inside a web stream node? I'm saying a node because web stream is also supposed to be a decentralized protocol, um, and so you have different nodes uh, and every node will, is supposed to have such a similar architecture like the one that you see on the screen where you have a central execution engine in the node that, let me actually show the nodes, 
uh, that is supposed to uh, run the IoT business program. Uh, and in our implementation, this is made by a WebAssembly virtual machine. Then the runtime will have virtual file system, uh, which is intended as um, a virtual storage uh, that WebAssembly modules will have access to. So your business logic will ha have some requirements to store and retrieve data during the, uh, the processing, and this virtual file system is what it can use. Then the, the runtime will also have some service endpoints, will also expose some network um, protocols, like some network services, for example, uh, HTTP, uh, MQTT, or remote procedure calls, and uh, other protocols based on what the application requires to communicate with the external world. For example, in our example, we will use the MQTT protocol to send data from machines to the web stream node. Um, a web stream node will also uh, require uh, a database storage uh, intended to store data that has been received by IoT devices. And this is, so this is for long-term storage of IoT data. Uh, and maybe it will also implement a data retention policy, depending on the, on the application. And also, uh, there may be uh, an SSI wallet module, which implements uh, like features like decentralized identifiers and uh, verifiable credentials um, functionalities, basically allowing the WebAssembly module to easily manage or easily deal with the authorization of the different actors uh, of a web stream network, starting from the node identity itself uh, up to managing the device identities and uh, user identities and uh, so on and so forth. And finally, uh, web stream node runtime will also include a decentralized consensus module, which will um, implement different uh, possible consensus mechanisms uh, for the web stream network and uh, eventually realizing a decentralized uh, layer for, for web stream. So before I keep going, uh, I just want to remind you again to um, register to the developers portal and specifically to subscribe to the newsletter. And the reason is because what we have seen now, uh, it's, it, this is the future architecture of uh, a web stream node runtime. But currently, we are still in the process of releasing the web stream node architecture uh, alpha, which is a single node type of architecture. Uh, so with, with some, uh, not all, uh, of these modules, and it will be extended in the future. So um, what we will see today uh, is actually based on some experimental code. So if you are interested in getting notified uh, on uh, when these releases will be available and start playing around with them, I highly suggest you to register to subscribe to our newsletter on the developer portal. So, Let's get uh, back to where we left, right? So the work to earn example, which is one of the possible use cases of a machine fi application. So um, when connecting real world data with blockchain applications, there are many things that, that you can do. There are many scenarios for token economies. Uh, and one, or maybe most obvious one, is the one where you use the blockchain token economy to incentivize behavior in the real world. So somehow, programming the real world with blockchain, with Web3. Uh, and so this is the case where we want to incentivize people to do healthy activity in the real world uh, by sending rewards uh, upon proof of working activity. And as uh, we anticipated last time, we are using a simple like a simple set of components to implement this example. So we will use an Arduino Nano 33 IoT board, which has a nice secure crypto chip on board that we need, and also a Wi-Fi antenna and uh, a nice accelerometer that also is a step counter uh, already integrated on board. We will uh, have a single node infrastructure for the WebStream node, 
and we will use of course the IOTEX, block, IOTEX blockchain for, for the trusted logic for the token economy for our dApp. So I uh, want to go through every single step of this simple architecture, uh, which eventually is the basis. It is common to every X to earn or do something to earn uh, application. So usually you have the manufacturing. So if you are the board manufacturing or the product manufacturing, in this case, it's um, a step counter or um, a health tracker or uh, but it can be anything it could be a vending machine depending on the token economy and on the type of decentralized application that you want to implement um, so you are going to manufacture your product uh, which will implement machine file oriented te techniques and specifically implementing a secure chip to manage the identity of the device on the blockchain and implementing IoT security techniques like making sure that the firmware is tamper proof, so what is usually called as secure boot, um, as well as implementing any IoT security. But most importantly, you will have this secure element on board that will securely generate and store a private key and will publicly provide you the, the corresponding public key. So your next step will be to store the public key uh, of these devices, devices in a smart contract on the blockchain. And this makes it very secure because um, it's almost impossible uh, to modify this registry because it's stored on a decentralized network like the blockchain is. Um, just a minor detail here, we are not going to store exactly the full, but only the first 20 bytes of the pub public key, just to make it easier on the blockchain to manage um, a shorter data type. The second step that you will do, you will most probably have a way to distribute this product to people. Most probably you will sell them to somebody or will give it them to somebody for some reason. So eventually it will go in the hands of the user, which will uh, own this device and because the user is also the one that's intended to receive the rewards for, uh, the, for kind, coming from this device then you need some process some binding process and so this can also be easily implemented on the blockchain where you are going to store the association between uh, each device and the user that owns that device um, in our example, we make it simple and we do it manually, as if the device manufacturer knew who is owning the device and is somehow asking their blockchain account to do the association. But in reality, in production, in a real application, uh, this is not very privacy preserving. Uh, so in reality, you should allow for some sort of binding, automatic binding process or autonomous binding process where the user uh, and the device can somehow uh, manage, for example, um, uh, a mechanism, a mechanism with uh, the block together with the blockchain to prove that the, the device is in their hands, and then to eventually um, store this association association on the blockchain autonomously without the intervention of a distributor or of the manufacturer. So after you have manufacture your product, you have stored the public key on the blockchain and then you have eventually distributed your devices and associated the device with the owner, the owner will start using this device, which will start sending uh, trusted data. So using the secure chip on board to sign uh, securely every data message it's sending. And it's sending the data to the web stream infrastructure whose role is to authorize this data to authorize the device, verify the data, store the data and store any other business um, um, like a concept or entity that is defined in the application in the database. And then in the end, the user at some point will start claiming rewards against the blockchain application, probably not directly interacting with the blockchain, but most probably going through a front end. And then the blockchain will emit an event uh, upon such a claim rewards request, uh, which could be uh, requesting a proof of real world activity, uh, something that would look like how many steps have been worked by this specific device. Um, for example, uh, in, the, in the last period of time, for example, from, from the last time that this user uh, claimed 
a real world. And then the web stream node would run its logic based on the real world data and eventually will call back the smart contract and will reply with our proof that the user walked a certain number of steps um, in, the specific, in the specified time range. And upon this reply, the smart contract would allow the, the user to claim uh, collected rewards. So this is our simple architecture for uh, a work to earn or for a, a do something to earn. Uh, so I just want to uh, go a little bit more into details into the, the blockchain part so that you will be more um, familiar with what you will see in the, in the, in the next and the last uh, episode of this series. So because we are storing the public key of the, our devices on the blockchain, for sure we will have a device registry smart contract. So a very simple smart contract just listing all the public keys or all the device IDs um, that we are manufacturing. So we know these devices have been built by, by us. And then for sure there will be a device binding smart contract where we manage the ownership. So which blockchain account, so which users wallet is owning which device and could be multiple devices. And of course there will be another smart contract uh, that we call work to earn which implements the real application in this case the real decentralized application so if you want the token economy or um, the rules to generate rewards upon working activity and that's what the user interacts with uh, the use this smart contract will allow uh, claiming rewards and uh, will allow users to withdraw rewards and because we are talking about rewards here you can guess that there is uh, a token, a cryptocurrency uh, involved in this process. And uh, a cryptocurrency or a token is itself a smart contract because usually a blockchain application does never use the native token of a blockchain. The, the, so, the only role of a native token is to keep the blockchain running and it's intended to uh, provide rewards to, to node operators. But every single blockchain application typically has one or more custom tokens that have been designed with their own token economy and rules uh, specific to that specific application. Uh, and so there will be a token that we have called STP or STEP token uh, in, in our ecosystem and of course it's connected to our, some, it's somehow connected to our work to earn contract. And the connection is pretty simple. We generate this, this token in the form of a smart contract and we just transfer the whole um, supply of this token entirely into the work to earn smart contract so that the work to earn smart contract will have the funds needed to send rewards to, to users. This is a very simple design and of course not suitable for, uh, again, for a production. Uh, token economy because we have just designed it with a fixed supply, uh, no mining, no burning, no minting, no burning. So uh, definitely this token is de is definitely supposed to finish uh, at some point and which would stop entirely uh, our ecosystem. So definitely not the, the way to do it. Uh, but depending on the application, you can have different rules to generate more tokens or to burn tokens based on uh, users activity in the real world. Okay, so uh, now let's focus a little bit on the business logic of, uh, of our application. So what the web stream node is actually doing, right, you know, in, in our application. So I, I've written here in human readable, readable language. Uh, so of course the web stream um, node uh, well, not of course, but in this case, we have implemented it this way. So we have the WebStream node monitoring the blockchain. Uh, specifically, we'll be monitoring two different smart contracts. One is the device registry smart contract. The other one is the work to earn smart contract. The reason why we monitor the device registry contract is because we want to um, somehow mirror the list of 
manufactured devices, so the list, the list of authorized devices in a local database in WebStream, to, just to make it more efficient to validate data without having to query the blockchain. However, you could very well query the blockchain uh, upon every data message that you receive. Uh, it's just a matter of design and efficiency and uh, um, just decision how to implement it. So, um, and the second smart contract that uh, the WebStream node monitors is the work to earn contract because WebStream has to know if the, uh, any user has requested uh, a, a, some tokens, has, is, has been claiming tokens, uh, and because the blockchain itself does not have initiate any communication with uh, the external world, it only provides an API for you to read the status of a smart contract, then the WebStream node is supposed to watch the blockchain for that specific smart contract for that specific event, uh, that's the claim uh, event. And when WebStream node will see this event, will run its logic. So the logic is pretty simple. Um, every time WebStream uh, detects a new device registered into the device registry smart contract, then it will just fetch the, the device ID from this event and store it in a, in a local table in a local database just to have the list of valid devices at hand. Then um, it will also monitor the MQTT service of the WebStream node uh, for new data messages incoming from devices, well, devices, of course. So if a new data message uh, has been received on MQTT, then the WebStream node would uh, first thing first would take the signature from this data message and verify it, meaning it will try to recover the public key that signed that data message. From the public key, as we said, we, we only use the first 20 bytes. So it will take the first 20 bytes that cor correspond to uh, the device ID that actually generated that signature, and it will check it against the list of authorized devices that we have locally into the WebStream database. As I said, you could also just query the, the, um, the device registry smart contract on chain and see if that specific device ID is registered. And if this device ID is registered, uh, then we will just store in a different table where we store the IoT data, we will just store the actual device ID, uh, the number of steps that are contained into the message, the timestamp contained into the data message, again, and uh, the signature also contained into the MQTT message. If the device is not registered, uh, we, we cannot find it in the smart contract, then it means this data is coming from an unknown uh, data source. Could be somebody who has, for example, wiped the device. So when you wipe the device, you also lose the, you also cancel like the crypto chip uh, keys. And so you can still use the device, but then uh, the key will be different. And so also the signature will uh, belong to a public key that has never been registered on the blockchain. And so the WebStream node can easily detect this and drop the data. Uh, alternatively, it could be just somebody trying with a software simulator to generate some data using the protocol of our device. And of course, because our device is private keys are stored into the secure chip, uh, nobody can get access to, to that private key. And so if I write a simulator, I will have to generate my own private key to sign the data. And again, the WebStream node would uh, immediately detect that, that the corresponding public key has never been registered to the blockchain by us. And so uh, it will anyway drop the data also in this case. Finally, when the WebStream node will uh, detect because it's also watching the work to earn smart contract. When the WebStream node will detect the claim event in the smart contract, this event will also include the claim details, which is which are the device ID we are claiming for, uh, the the timestamp we are we are claiming from, and the timestamp we are we are claiming to. Uh, so the time range we are interested in. Uh, then WebStream will just use this data to query the local. IoT data database, fetch all the, the data messages incoming from that specific device for which 
the timestamp is included in the time range, and then given how our data message, our IoT data message is created, it will just take the last, like the most recent data message, the the, the first data message in the time in the time range, and just calculate the difference of the steps to get how many steps have been uh, worked in the time frame. Because I wanted to show you the data message again. I don't have it here. So anyway, our device is sending a very simple data message. Uh, apart from the device ID and from the, the, the message signature, we, the, our data message is very simple. It's just sending out the total number of steps that have been worked ever and the corresponding timestamp when the reading has been made. This way, all the data records that are in our WebStream database uh, can be used to uh, extract any working activity in any time frame just by subtracting. Uh, as I said in the last, last uh, in the first part of the of the workshop, you can be as creative as you want uh, in, in this step, and you can implement your IoT logic in any way you want. You can decide to drop, for example working sessions that are not long enough. Or you can decide to value more working that have sessions that have been, uh, uh, that happened, for example, in specific regions, uh, if you have a GPS on your device. Uh, or you could, for example, value more working activity that have been done in group of people together. Uh, again, if you have um, a GPS or maybe using Bluetooth, I don't know. And so eventually our WebStream node would somehow calculate a balance in terms of steps that have been uh, worked in the, in the time range and just call back the smart contract to uh, send back the reply or the proof of the working activity for that specific device in the time range. And when the smart contract will receive that proof, it will apply the token economy to to that proof and say, for example, based on how many steps has been worked in the time frame, it will uh, accumulate some rewards in the form of the step token uh, based on some simple token economy rule that can be just one token for every step or can be 10 tokens for every step or can be uh, 10 tokens for every step in the first month uh, since the application has been released and then decreasing token economy incentives along the time, uh, or whatever you wanted to implement with your creativity. So this is more or less how everything works. Yeah, this was an extra slide. So again, before we take a look at the code, uh, I will stop here for a moment. Uh, and while uh, doing this pose, I want to also tell you that the code that we will see now is not based on the actual WebStream uh, runtime release that's expected for uh, Q4 of 2022. So um, we will take a look at the code just to see what we have been talking about implemented. But in reality, uh, in, in the WebStream node, it will be implemented as uh, a WebStream module that you can create by uh, compiling a C++ logic or um, using Rust, if you're familiar with Rust, or uh, there are different languages that you can use to compile to a WebAssembly module. Uh, I would say Rust is the best uh, choice, maybe, because it's been built exactly to create WebAssembly modules. And so uh, what we will see now is mostly experimental code that we have used to create we have used to create proof of concepts in the last two years, uh, but eventually the the um, like the, the behavior is the same. So uh, that's why I am uh, in encouraging you uh, to register to the to the sub to subscribe to the newsletter so that once it's ready, you can start experimenting with the real Node runtime. Uh, so. I'm stopping here for a moment. I've not monitored the chat. Um, just uh, are there any questions? Is it? Uh, yes, we we had some questions from uh, Professor Liu uh, about the tokenomics. Mm -hmm. um, I 
I think you covered a lot of it. Uh, I answered the, you know, briefly in the chat. Um, but uh, I think the more important part was uh, if there could be an actual um, monetary value for this token uh, that is rewarded and uh, how that maybe could work. Yeah, uh, so yeah, I see the question here. Uh, financially, can these rewards uh, be exchanged to something else? So yeah, this, this is part of the token economy design. So everybody can create a token on a blockchain. That doesn't mean the token has any value and that you can exchange it for, uh, for example, a stable coin, right? Of course. Uh, it's the responsibility of the ecosystem builder to design the token economy in a way that this token will have a new uh, utility and using it as a reward is not the utility it's uh, uh, on the opposite of many of many like scam ecosystems the reward is the reward part but the utility has to be implemented in the ecosystem for example if this one would was um, uh, an incentive mechanism implemented by a smart city that wants to program the behavior, not, not nice to say, but <laughs> program the behavior of their citizens uh, in a way that they want them to be more healthy and so save money on the healthcare, for example, then this uh, administration of the smart city could give utility to this token to, um, to make it desirable for users to get these rewards and so eventually to incentivize the activity. And then the utility could be, for example, free tickets to the museum or could be, um, I don't know, you won't pay taxes for, uh, or you can pay taxes with this token or whatever, right? So the, that the smart city is saving a lot of money on the healthcare. On the other side, uh, citizens are living a more healthy lifestyle and are also saving money on other services like taxes or uh, museums or whatever so this is a simple example but you always have to balance the utility and the rewards in your token economy and if you do that then the token has a utility this means that there are other people that would be interested in buy that token so in this case then you can uh, expect there will be uh, a, mar uh, a decentralized market for, for this token somewhere um, for example, people that are using this tap counter can they can spend these tokens, but they can also sell the token to other people that want it to just use the services, uh, and and this means that could be a decentralized marketplace. And typically, the project or the entity that is deploying that is designing the ecosystem and is deploying the application will also. Uh, provide some liquidity maybe to a decentralized marketplace for example in the form of uh, liquidity between their token their custom token and for example a stable coin or, or the native token of the network just put this liquidity into a decentralized exchange on the same network and then everybody will be able to uh, for example earn these tokens and then instead of spending them into the ecosystem they could decide to exchange them against this liquidity into the decentralized um, exchange for other people that may want to to buy this token for uh, for for the other token so uh, so yeah uh, it's not easy to build uh, an ecosystem and to build the token economy and to build the utility um, but eventually yeah it's doable definitely you just need some uh, um, creativity and of course uh, making sure the ecosystem is built uh, um, with good criteria. Um, I don't know if there is anything else. Uh, no, then I asked if, uh, I mean, if anybody else has actually other questions, uh, feel free to post them in the chat. Uh, but uh, so far, Professor Liu was uh, the only one that uh, posted the question, and that was the tokenomics that we just answered. Okay. Great, I hope everything is clear and that uh, the students are just shy. Uh, so, uh, uh, now let, let me take this uh, opportunity to ask another question. Uh, Please go ahead. Yeah, so uh, while I, uh, I, I, I listen to your uh, explanation of the IoTX mm -hmm. ecosystem, mm -hmm. it reminds me there are a lot of similarity between uh, the, the hardware wallet and uh, uh, the, the hardware used, for example, the mm. wall, wall to earn. Mm. Can you 
uh, describe what's the difference between a hardware wallet uh, uh, with uh, uh, a system provided by OTX. Yeah, for sure. Let me actually find a hardware wallet, but I don't have any. I have this one. <laughs> so I can also show one. Uh, so this is what what the professor is talking about. There are different uh, type of products like this one, and uh, this one is a hardware wallet. So as you observed, there are some um, overlapping hardware designs. Means this is probably this type of devices are probably the only or the first for sure, uh, probably still the only type of device that. Uh, used these crypto chips with blockchain. Uh, so these crypto chips have uh, actually existed for years uh, since IoT has been um, growing as a technology, uh, has been becoming more popular with, uh, as a technology. But they are mostly used to um, to like to manage the um, SSL communication, so the certificates and keys to manage the SSL con communication between the device and the endpoint that usually the it's usually the centralized endpoint maybe the AWS or the cloud endpoint of the device manufacturer so this these chips are mostly used to uh, store these certificates for SSL communication uh, in IoT devices so these type of devices um, used these crypto chips to store the private key that then they use to sign a blockchain transaction so the way they work, you have the software wallet, typically it's MetaMask, then you connect this hardware device to the MetaMask, to the software wallet, and then the software wallet in this scenario is not anymore acting as the private key generator and store. And store. It's actually delegating to this device to create the private key, to store it securely inside this crypto chip, and to sign the blockchain message. So when you send a transaction using a, a software wallet connected to a hardware wallet, the software wallet will just build the, uh, the transaction message, send it to the hardware wallet, the hardware wallet will generate the signature and will send back the signature to the software wallet, and then the software wallet would put everything together, the signature and the transaction message, and send it to the blockchain API, broadcast it to the blockchain nodes, uh, eventually for um, my for, for like executing this transaction on the blockchain. So this is um, one possibility. I mean, you can build the same device uh, using the board. Well, not exactly that board, but a different board, because that board has the secure chip, but the secure chip included on this board specifically uh, does not support blockchain signature. I mean, it supports elliptic signature, but not with the curve that is used by Ethereum or by IOTEX. So this one would not be able to sign, to pr produce a valid signature for a blockchain transaction. So there are different boards that have a secure chip that can sign using the uh, correct curve for the elliptic signature, elliptic curve signature uh, that could work as a, a signature for the blockchain. But this is a very limiting way of using these crypto chips. The innovation on the IoTech side that we have done in terms of using these chips is we think these chips can be the foundation for the identity of an IoT device on the blockchain. That's when we store the public key on the blockchain. So, and then these devices will start using that chip to sign the data and make the data verifiable. It's different from signing the data or signing a blockchain transaction. So, of course, if it supports blockchain cryptography, it could also sign blockchain transactions and send them to the blockchain. So work as an hardware wallet, even an autonomous hardware wallet, because this one is not autonomous. This one is an interactive scenario, but it's not an autonomous, it's not an IoT device. This one could be, has a CPU and you can, it's programmable, so you could create an IoT device. And this one is actually the example. This is an example device built by IoTex that has a crypto chip inside the crypto chip can also sign blockchain transactions, but we are not using it as an hardware wallet to sign blockchain transactions. We are using it as a tracker device. This has temperature climate sensor, humidity, temperature, pressure, as a GPS on board, also has an accelerometer, uh, also has an ambient, ambient light sensor, also has um, 
something else I can't remember. So many different sensors as a secure chip, and so you can program it to become a trusted tracker. The secure chip is used to sign the data, so to make the data verifiable. And uh, the public key of this secure chip becomes the, the, uh, the foundation or the identity of the IoT device. So it's a more wide, um, more, a broad, more broad way of using these same chips that are included in these devices here, whose uh, use is very, very limited, just to sign blockchain transactions in an interactive way. Here they're used autonomously by the device if you want to sign blockchain transactions, but that, this is not machine fight, this is just a tool. Or in a machine fight scenario, to sign the data that the device has been used and store the public key of the secure chip on the blockchain as the identity of the device to recognize a device that we have created. So with the secure firmware and making sure uh, the data is actually coming from this device. I, I hope this was clear enough. Uh, it's a little bit twisted, but um, I hope I've explained it uh, well enough. Yeah, it is, it's, it's very helpful. Uh, as one uh, follow-up question, so is the older binding part similar in, uh, in the hardware wallet versus the more generalized IoTX devices? Um, I, I did not get the first part of the question. Is? Uh, the owner binding. Oh. Mm. The owner binding, okay. Is it what? Is that the similar mm. in the hardware wallet mm. versus the devices mm. about IoT mm. apps. So the, the device binding concept is something that arises from the machine fi concept, where you want to rework. It's actually not, not new as well, because in any IoT infrastructure uh, using cloud, a centralized, using normal centralized clouds, you also have the device binding. When you usually buy, for example, an IP camera or uh, any other uh, IoT device, you usually register your device uh, somehow in some sort of a way uh, in the ecosystem of the device manufacturer. You associate your email and password account and then you register the device uh, serial number or ID or whatever, or it's automated. It gets registered and associated to you. Uh, typically, it's just for tracking user activity. But this binding concept is even more important in, in a machine file scenario where you have to send rewards to somebody for the work that the device has done. In this case, it's the user doing work with the device, but it could be a vending machine that I've uh, uh, like bought and put it on the street and it's sell, sending, selling things, goods to people autonomously and then it's providing trusted data on what it's sending or how much it's earning to the web stream node. And so that machine is somehow making money for me in, in some way by providing this data to the blockchain applications. Uh, but of course, you are not sending the rewards to the machine. I could own a thousand machines, right, that are working for me. Could be autonomous cars or could be anything else uh, or could be different health, health trackers, right, that I own. So you have to bind all these devices to the owner so that at least the owner can receive the, the rewards for all these devices in a simple way, as well as it will be enabled to manage these devices or to configure these devices uh, using the blockchain. And this binding is, is information is important. While using the hardware wallet, there is no real bi binding. I mean, this is the only involved wallet account, the only involved blockchain account when you use it. You just, it's, it's the only existing wallet account. You use it to transfer tokens. That's it. While in the binding concept in a machine fi application, there are multiple accounts. There are all the accounts of all the machines that you are binding to the single account of the owner. And so the different accounts of the machines are used mostly for identity, to identify the machine and authorize the machine while the account of the owner is used to receive rewards and the binding is used to know who should get the rewards for a specific activity of a specific machine. So I would say there is no such a concept when you use a hardware wallet, uh, but you need it in any IoT applications and uh, even more in a machine fi IoT application where you definitely need to send rewards to somebody on, on behalf of the device.
Oh, great. Thank you. Sure. Okay. Uh, let's let's go ahead actually um, so the idea is to take a look at the code oh here is the message I wanted to show before um, just a reminder of uh, where we left off right we had we left off with uh, this board here uh, where we flashed the firmware and uh, this firmware is sending out messages that look like this one uh, we are only interested in the actual data message which includes the total number of steps ever since when this was started the first time and the timestamp of the reading and of course we are interested in the signature and this is the signature of this message and uh, that's it that's all we need uh, the device ID can be easily recovered by recovering the public key of the signature and uh, as I said it's just the first 20 bytes of the public key of the device so, um, yeah, let's take a look at, at the code, right? Let me, let me see if I can um, show it easily. So I've configured a web stream node on um, a Linux machine in the cloud, on a VPS in the cloud. And uh, what I want to show you uh, yeah. Let me connect to the machine. Okay. Let me open it again. Just connecting with the um, VS code to the remote machine to show the soft the, the source code. So um, I think I've mentioned where to find this code, but anyway, uh, it's currently on uh, my personal repository on uh, on GitHub, and uh, let me actually show it. on github.com it's this one um, the github is I lost it yes github.com slash simone rom uh, this one and it's this one work to earn Arduino in case you want to just dive a little bit deeper but as I said this software is going to be deprecated. It's already deprecated. It's just to show you the concept. But uh, this one is just a JavaScript implementation of the um, uh, behavior of a possible web stream runtime. But it's not based on the real architecture. So it's just an example. But it works anyway. Um, so. So inside the software, you just will get inside the branch or the, the, the repository, what you get is this code here, where uh, there are only three main folders, four folders. One is the blockchain folder that contains the smart contracts used for the work to earn. And you will see this one in more detail with Giuseppe um, on, I think, on uh, October 20. And then there is a devices folder where I have included uh, the sketch of the Arduino board, so the firmware of the board. And there is the source folder plus these files here that implement the actual web stream uh, runtime, I would say. It's not a runtime in, in the sense that, unfortunately, you cannot like have this w nice web assembly module. It's not a virtual machine that is programmable. It's just one piece of code. That does everything so uh, just for a proof of concept so um, yeah so basically I want to show you our project uh, which is just called up uh, in this web stream uh, like example runtime um, so this app is made of a configuration file 
And this configuration file is just telling the WebStream runtime what to do, right? What we have been talking about until now. So in this configuration, you're just telling the WebStream node, I, I'm interested in running the MQTT service because I want to talk with the external world using the MQTT protocol. That's the protocol used to uh, send data from the, from the device. And I'm also in, interested in running the blockchain monitor service of the WebStream runtime. This service is the one that uh, independently or in parallel uh, watch smart contracts on the blockchain to detect events on, in these smart contracts. Um, and we need it, we need it to, to work. And then you are also configuring a private key for, uh, for these WebStream runtime. Because at some point, this WebStream runtime has to call back the smart contract uh, to reply with the proof. It's also important that the public key corresponding to this private key, so somehow the public key of the WebStream node, if you want, uh, is somehow the only one authorized in the smart contract to send a reply with a proof. And that's how we trust the proof that's coming from the node, because we are, have authorized the public key corresponding to this private key in our smart contract that uh, will verify, somehow will verify that the proof is coming from this specific public key corresponding to, to this private key. Then also, uh, given that we are using the blockchain service of the WebStream node, uh, we also have to configure the start height, meaning because the blockchain, of course, uh, is a chain of blocks and uh, the, the height of a blockchain is the number of the last block that has been attached to the blockchain. So we have to tell the WebStream node where, when, I would say, to start monitoring the blockchain. And that's usually when we have deployed our smart contracts. There is no point for this WebStream node to start indexing or watching the blockchain from the very beginning, from the first block of the blockchain four years ago, right? will take a very long time to, to scan the blockchain, all these blocks, uh, and it's, there's no point to do that because we have just deployed our smart contract, so there is no data before uh, this specific height. And then you configure these two services. You start configuring the blockchain service by saying, um, I have one configuration of type contract, uh, I can create this configuration because I'm running, I, I'm, I've enabled this, this module here. And so this first configuration will say, I want you, WebStream node, uh, to watch this address on the blockchain. And I want, and uh, yeah, and also I have to give the ABI, this is a more technical detail, but you can easily, uh, dive deeper alone, it's basically the somehow the ABI, so the specification of, uh, of the functions of the method exposed by this smart contract. Otherwise, the node will not know how to, to call a smart contract function. Uh, and also, I'm saying for this smart contract, I'm interested into this event, device registry. And this event is omitted by the smart contract when a new device is registered by the manufacturer. And also I'm telling the WebStream node, when you detect this event, you will have to call this handler, this JavaScript function that I will define uh, elsewhere. Keep in mind that in the real WebStream runtime, this is implemented as a WebAssembly module. I mean, this behavior is implemented as a WebAssembly module. Uh, then I have a similar configuration just for a different smart contract, and this is the work to earn smart contract, the one where the user that the user uh, interacts with to claim the tokens. And when uh, the user claims the rewards, that smart contract would emit this event. So I'm watching this event, activity requested, and I'm telling the WebStream node to execute this logic when this event is detected on the blockchain. Pretty simple. And finally, I'm configuring this module here, the MQTT module, because I have to tell the WebStream node what to do when a new message is detected on the MQTT service. Uh, it's also called an, an MQTT broker. And the role of an MQTT broker is somehow to distribute messages incoming from different devices. It's a subscription model uh, of a service where there are 
publishing like publisher subscriber type of model where the those who send the data publish it in the broker or in a specific path and those who are interested in receiving those data from the MQTT broker they subscribe to a specific path or to a specific um, range of paths in this case it's uh, it's we are using a regular expression to define what type of paths we are we are interested in and because the device is is publishing uh, the messages in a path made of slash device slash the public key of the device slash data we are expressing the public key uh, this way using a regular expression and so basically we are configuring this module saying saying I'm interested I'm subscribing to any uh, MQTT um, it's called topic to any MQTT topic that looks like this one because that's where my devices are sending data and uh, I'm not interested in any other path if this MQTT service is used for anything else in this case it's not uh, and when you receive an MQTT message in, on, to one of these topics, you will have to call this logic that we call on MQTT data, and it's just a JavaScript function. So more or less, this is the configuration of how the WebStream node should work. Of course, there are some missing pieces here. First, we, uh, we said we are going to, re to store something in a, in a database. So I'm not going into the details here because uh, it's different from what it will be in, in the real web stream runtime. But anyway, it's, it's simple. Uh, we have a folder here where we have defined two uh, tables in our Postgres database. Uh, one is device.model and the other one is device.data.model. Device.model has just a single column, so just a, a table with a single column where we are storing the list of device IDs that uh, as we mentioned before, it's just getting synced with the, the blockchain device registry database. Every time a new device gets registered on a database, we want to store that device ID in our database in WebStream. And so that's where we store it, in this table. And the other one uh, is just, I think, four or five columns. It's a simple table where we store the IoT data incoming from devices that we have verified. I mean, we have verified the data uh, and so we are, we are storing the relevant IoT data into this table. And specifically, we are storing the, for every data message, we are storing a record in this table made of the device ID who sent that message, the number of steps included in the data message, the timestamp included in the data message, and the signature included in the MQTT uh, message. We keep storing the signature because we want maybe use this data at a later time and we want to still be able to verify uh, the signature. So to verify that the data is actually trusted, coming from a trusted device. So that's how the database is made, very simple itself. And uh, the other uh, concept is, of course, where are, where are this logic? Where is this logic? these functions, right? Which is what to do when something happens. And these ones in these simple proof of concepts are implemented in JavaScript into this file here, handlers.ts. So I'm going through them very quickly, uh, mostly at a high level. So we have implemented on device registered. On device registered is what we told the WebStream node to run when this event, I'm oh sorry, uh, this event is detected in this smart contract. And we said you have to call on device registered. And on device registered is, uh, let me move this away. On device registered is here into this handlers file. Uh, so this one is basically doing what we said. Uh, it receives the event from the, the blockchain, so uh, it will just extract the data from the event. This, if you will see it later uh, into the day number three of this workshop, you will see that this event will just publish the device ID that has been just registered into the smart contract. So we fetch this argument or from, the, from the blockchain log, from the blockchain event, the device ID, 
we remove that zero that zero x prefix from it, put it make it lowercase to not have issues when matching strings, and log it, and then we basically use the device uh, the device uh, model the device um, table into our local database uh, to store this device ID, and that's what we have been talking about till now. Then we have the other handler, so. The other one is when the activity requested event is detected from the work to earn smart contract. These are just placeholder addresses. In uh, lesson number three with Giuseppe, you will actually deploy these smart contracts. You will see how they, they work. Uh, and then once you deploy them, you will have uh, the actual address for those contracts. And you will just go in this file and replace these contracts with the actual ones that you have. Uh, deployed and then put everything together. So this one is the handler that has to be run when uh, a user claims his tokens in the work to earn smart contract. This contract would emit this event and we want to run this function, which is on activity requested. So on activity requested, the event will provide this information, specifically an ID for the request the user address, we are not using it in this simple example. The device ID, we want to request uh, the proof for. The from timestamp to to timestamp, we are interested in. In our example, this one are automatically created by the smart contract itself. The smart contract will keep track of the last time has been made a claim and the time when a new claim has been made. And this, ones are the, this one is the time frame that is passed in the event. So with this data, it's pretty simple to query our database. So there is a process data request function. So here, this one is implementing our business logic. It's fetching the data from the database, specifically all the data records coming from this device ID, for which the timestamp is included in this range. Right? I'm not going into this one. It's really, really trivial. So when we and this function will provide us the number of steps that have been worked in the time frame based on the data and will return us this number or uh, will return false here and uh, an error string if maybe there is no data in the database or something went wrong with this calculation. And so here we are just uh, basically using uh, a blockchain client as a blockchain library, which is a very popular one. Um, to call back our smart contract and send the smart contract, call back the smart contract, specific function of the smart contract uh, that once in input, once the request ID I'm replying to, and it's the same I've fetched from the event, so it should match. And the total steps uh, that I'm sending back as a proof for, for this request, and of course, if there has been any error and uh, the error message. So this one, and let, let, let's go through it very quickly. Um, uh, I'll not go into the details, but this is basically the um, interacting with the blockchain. And interacting with the blockchain, we, you can do it with a number of libraries. Uh, any Ethereum library that works with Ethereum also works with IOTEX. Uh, we are using this one, I think. Uh, can't find it. I think it's uh, this one that we are initializing with uh, the blockchain endpoint of the IOTEX blockchain. And uh, this one, we are importing it from the configuration of the WebStream node. Uh, so basically, it's just uh, about configuring the blockchain transaction. So the gas price we want to use, the fee we want to pay, and eventually using the library to create uh, a signed transaction and uh, the signature is going to be made with uh, the private key with, that we have included into the configuration of the WebStream node. Uh, and uh, this is basically how a, the blockchain transaction looks like to call a specific smart contract function that we have defined here. We are calling this function, this method of our contract. And uh, the contract is the one that we are fetching the address. We are fetching it from the configuration. Um, so for the work to earn contract, we fetch the address from the 
from the webstream context, which has been loaded from the webstream configuration. So we fetch the contract data, which is basically the address and uh, and uh, the function the functions that it provides. And we the method we want to call is the claim activity reply that's intended for us to send back the proof. And um, we prepare the transaction, we sign the transaction, and eventually we await. Uh, the, the, sorry, we sign the transaction here, and eventually we await for the transaction to be broadcast and verified on a blockchain. And once it's um, verified, uh, it's effective. I mean, the, 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 this means the blockchain has been executed and it has done whatever it was supposed to do upon receiving this proof. And the final handler we are looking to is on MQTT data. So what to do when we receive a new message from a device on the MQTT protocol? And this one is here. I would say this one is maybe the central one because that's where we verify uh, if the data is coming from a trusted device or not. So this is more into a little bit of cryptography. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, I think you, you can maybe go deeper a little bit into it alone. But this one is basically being called when a new MQTT message is received. So we can get the payload from the MQTT message, which is basically our message, our JSON message. So we are evaluating this message into an, a JSON object here. And we put it on the log and finally we use uh, we have implemented this function which is doing the actual verification. So we pass the JSON object which also contains the message and the signature. And so it will this function will use the elliptic curve library, which is important here. Oh no, sorry, here. And also these ones and the different other uh, crypto functions to basically extract the public key from the signature. Then from the public key, we take the first 20 bytes, which is the device ID who has produced that signature, and we match it into the database, into the, the table where we are, are, have the list of our, all our devices. If it's included in that list, then it will return the actual public key uh, that has been recovered by the, the signature. If it's not included, we are saying, hey, uh, the device identity check has failed. Uh, we are dropping this data. We're not doing anything with this data. Actually, we are returning from the function. But if it returned a, a public key means that the device, the signer was uh, listed in the devices, then we are just storing the data in the database. Starting from the JSON, we are just storing our record so we are fetching the device ID, the number of steps, the timestamp, and the signature, and uh, we are storing it into the, into the device data table. And with these, we have completed more or less the configuration of the WebStream node. As I said, this is all JavaScript. Uh, this is not how the actual WebStream node architecture uh, will look like. And, uh, I think by the end of this month, we should have an alpha release that you can program using uh, a WebAssembly. So this logic will be possible to be, well, you will be able to implement it using WebAssembly. Uh, and it's also much more modular, where you have the runtime, which is a WebAssembly virtual machine, then you have uh, modules that you can configure, for example, to watch the blockchain and uh, convert a blockchain event into a web stream event. And uh, you will have other modules that allow you to uh, I don't know, talk to the blockchain or maybe implement a decentralized storage and so on and so forth. And in the future, we will also implement the provide more functionalities in terms of modules. And the most important one will be the consensus module. Once this will be available, it will be possible to run not only a single node architecture, but uh, a multiple node architecture implementing a specific consensus of your choice. Uh, and this consensus will be used to uh, send proofs to the blockchain smart contract uh, after uh, they have been passed through a consensus. So not anymore trusting the single node because we have created it. I'm stopping here. We are, I think we have five or eight minutes left that I want to leave for questions here because it was uh, probably everything new, even for people that 
already are familiar with blockchain applications. Um, so yeah, if you have any questions, uh, let me know. So far, no questions in the chat, but uh, I think if you guys want to type, feel free. Otherwise, you're also allowed to unmute yourself and, um, and speak if you prefer. I dropped a few links in the chat also if you wanted to do a little bit more research. The most recent link is the repository on GitHub that uh, Simon was showing. Uh, Pebble Tracker, one we talked about uh, earlier, and uh, also a few more links if you scroll up. Um, just, you know, to, for example, the, like the secure element, the secure boot on the Arduino board, and things like that. So if nobody has questions, I will spend uh, the last five minutes um, by explaining very quickly how to in interact with the DataTex blockchain using the MetaMask wallet, because that's something you will see in the next uh, and last um, episode of this workshop uh, in real life with Giuseppe. So uh, at some point, uh, you will see everything working. So Giuseppe will show you how the smart contracts are made, how they work. Uh, he will deploy these smart contracts uh, and eventually will configure the WebStream node with these specific smart contracts. Then it will show you how actually doing some fake working activity with the device, it will send the data. The WebStream node will verify the data and will reject the data initially. Uh, because th that device ID will not be registered. Then Giuseppe will show you how to uh, interact with one of these smart contracts, the device registry, to register that device ID and uh, how to bind in the other contract that device ID to your blockchain wallet. So that part is what I want to show you now. Uh, MetaMask is the most popular blockchain wallet for desktop. It's in the form of a plugin for Chrome browsers. Uh, you can download it from, uh, I think, uh, MetaMask. Uh, this one. Oh. From MetaMask.io. So you can download it as a plugin for uh, Chrome or for, for, for um, uh, Brave in this case. And install it. You get it here. You configure the wallet with, uh, by, by like saving the recovery phrase that it will give you. Make sure you save it. If you, if you intend to, to use that wallet to transfer uh, actual tokens with actual value, uh, otherwise you will lose everything if you don't have your recovery phrase stored in a safe place. Uh, and then, uh, let me, yeah. And then you will have uh, like, a new wallet address, meaning a public key. This is a public key of the private key that the wallet has generated for you and is securely storing for you. Uh, it's in the form of, a, it's called a web uh, a blockchain address, but it's derived by the, from the private key. So you can also call it the public key if you want. It's derived from the public key. So uh, it's just shorter and uh, with a different uh, representation in a different format. So with when you have an account, you also have to tell MetaMask to connect to the blockchain, so to use a specific blockchain. So by default, MetaMask is configured to interact with the Ethereum blockchain. Uh, if you want to have MetaMask to interact with the IOTEX blockchain, you will have to add a new network. Here. So I already have the IOTEX testnet configured and the IOTEX mainnet configured. I'm deleting them. Um, so you can both add a new network and in insert the network configuration that you find on docs.iotex.io into the IOTEX wallet, MetaMask wallet. We have the actual configuration that you have to input. Or uh, you can go to iotexdefy.com where you have a nice button here to automatically configure MetaMask. So if I click here, it will add the IOTEX mainnet data to MetaMask. In your case, you will have to add the testnet, approve, and switch. So now MetaMask includes the configuration for the IOTEX blockchain, and you can select if you want to work on the IOTEX testnet or on the IOTEX mainnet. 
Uh, and the second thing that you will need, you will need test tokens to be able to pay for blockchain transactions. When you deploy the smart contracts, when uh, your web stream node is sending the replies, uh, I, I possibly using the same uh, blockchain account. So uh, MetaMask shows you the balance of this account on the IOTEX blockchain in terms of IOTEX tokens. But you will also use another token which is in the form defined in the form of a smart contract, which is the step token we have been talking bef uh, before about before. So Giuseppe will show you how this smart contract looks like, and he will deploy it to the smart con to the IOTEX blockchain. But if you want to know if you have any balance of this token, you will have to add it to MetaMask because by default MetaMask only shows you any other wallet as well, only shows you the balance of the native token of the blockchain, but it supports the ability to show you the balance of uh, other tokens defined in the form of a smart contract, so not native tokens. To do that, you just go on assets here and you do import tokens. You tell MetaMask what's the contract address of the token that you want to import, uh, and then it will detect that token and will add it. I have already done it, for example, for different tokens here, another step token that I have uh, defined by myself. I have imported the smart contract address here and uh, I've also tested the work to earn and I've also earned 69 uh, fake tokens, step tokens uh, that I have defined. So that's what you will see uh, in the next uh, lecture uh, with Giuseppe and eventually you will see that doing some working activity then you will be able to claim this activity in the smart contract, in the work to earn smart contract. The work to earn smart contract would emit this event the web stream would detect the event, would do the calculation, will send back the proof. The work to earn smart contract with the proof will implement the token economy and will credit you some step tokens inside the smart contract. And then you will be able to call the smart contract again at any time to withdraw all the credits in terms of step tokens that you have accumulated into the smart contract and then get them transferred to your uh, MetaMask account because assuming you are doing the claim with the, the MetaMask account that has been bound to that specific device you are claiming rewards for. To prevent you claim rewards for a device that's not yours, of course. Um, yeah, I think with that said, it's all for today. Uh, I hope you have enjoyed this uh, lesson number two, this workshop lesson number two. I will stop sharing. And uh, I don't see questions, can't see any question here. No, no questions yet. Professor, did you want to say anything or maybe do a quick uh, goodbye message? Uh, yeah, it's at your perfect timing. Because <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, on the dot. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, presentation, the, the detailed demonstration is very helpful. I'm very interested. Yeah, I'm sorry I could not show you the actual runtime, web stream runtime yet, but uh, definitely invite you to check it out when we release it. Uh, it's much more interesting, especially if any of you is interested in WebAssembly and uh, the possibility to run a WebAssembly module in a virtual machine uh, instead of in a browser. Uh, I think it's a very promising technology, a very interesting language uh, to learn. And it's also very secure and very um, high performance in terms of uh, um, like virtual machine. Uh, definitely useful in, in this scenario where there will be probably a lot of processing, data processing, when um, you have many devices and uh, a huge volume of data that you have to process in a web stream network. Yeah, I would say that's all on my side. So thank you guys for uh, attending and uh, till the last minute. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. I'm looking forward to meeting you on Tuesday. So. Yeah.